All right, I'm going to go ahead and re-record the lecture from Monday, March 6th. Uh, we had, I had some technical difficulties with uh, the output, and some of you were having trouble hearing what I was saying, which is uh, not something we want to have. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do this over again, just in, the, in my own office, and uh, that way you can look at this lecture again if you uh, want to review anything or if you weren't able to make it to class on Monday. So what we're going to do is we're going to move on to Chapter 6, which starts talking about chemical reactions that happen in solution. Um, so we're going to you know, move through eventually and start talking about different types of chemical reactions in solutions. We're going to talk about some different ways to balance reactions and also uh, stoichiometry for solution reactions. But before we get to that, we need to start today by talking about just some general properties and definitions related to aqueous solutions. All right, so we had a bonus quiz. If you were here on Monday, you know that. But let's get on to the Chapter 6 material. So first we have to define some, some key terms that we want to use to, uh, you know, to tell us what a solution is and, and some of the important concepts that we're going to start with. So we probably all have some basic idea of what a solution is, but the technical definition of a solution is a homogeneous mixture. And when we say homogeneous, we mean it has apparently a single phase. So we can't tell that there's two or more things mixed together. It looks like one continuous substance but in reality it's a mixture of two or more substances. So that's kind of the most general definition of, of a solution. Now for the purposes of this course and really for the purposes of how people usually talk about solutions, in most cases these solutions involve a liquid as one of the components or sometimes both of the components. But usually there's going to be a liquid phase um, that's involved there are solutions that involve solids, we call those alloys. There are solutions that involve gases as well. But usually the word solution is most frequently applied to things that involve liquids. So there are very many examples of everyday, in your everyday life of solutions. So if you ever go swimming in the ocean, salt water is a solution, consisting mainly of salt and water, but of course some other things. Most beverages that you drink are, are solutions, so things like juices and certain adult beverages are considered solutions as well. Air, as I mentioned, there's solutions involving gases. Air is a solution involving several gases. And then um, gasoline, which you put in your car, is also a mixture of a few different liquids um, as, as a solution. So those are kind of some examples of solutions. And then within a solution, you have two main components. You have solute and solvent. So typically speaking, the solute is defined as the minor component. So whatever you have less of in the solution. For some solutions that involve you know, two liquids mixed together in approximately equal amounts, it's fairly arbitrary what you consider the solute and the solvent. But typically, the solute is the minor component. And it's going to be the substance that is dissolved. So whatever is dissolved, we call the solute. And then the solvent is what we, it will be referred to the major part of the solution major component of a solution. And this is going to be the substance that does the dissolving. So whatever we're dissolving the solute in is going to be called the solvent. In most cases, because we're talking about liquid-based solutions, the solvent is going to be the liquid that's the major part of that solution. And in this course, we're primarily going to talk about aqueous solutions, which is solutions involving water. So this term aqueous that we're going to start using, and it's in the title of this lecture, it means dissolved in water. So an aqueous solution is a solution involving water, or an aqueous ionic compound is an ionic compound dissolved in water, and so on. So to sort of recap, when you have a solution, it's going to be a solute and a solvent that are blended together into a homogeneous mixture that we call the solution. Now we're talking mainly about aqueous solutions, which are solutions in water. And so to help us understand why is water so good at dissolving things, and especially why is it so good at dissolving ionic compounds, let's talk about the polarity of water. And this is a review of things that we learned back in Chapter 4 when we talked about molecular polarity. Um, but keep in mind there, there are a few main reasons why uh, water is, is polar. So we have one is that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. And as we talked about 
starting in chapter 3 really, when you have two atoms bonded together with different electronegativities, the bond is going to be polarized, meaning there's going to be an unequal distribution of electrons with more of the electron density on the more electronegative atom. So each OH bond itself is polar, and then if we look at the shape of water, it has a bent shape, which we should all be familiar with. And this means that the individual bond dipoles do not cancel out. So remember that just because something has polar bonds doesn't mean the molecule is polar. But when you have a bent shape, you're going to also get uh, molecular polarity because the individual dipoles don't cancel out. So there's a few ways of describing this. So what we have over here, we have again these individual dipoles here, which I'll highlight in blue. And then those add together to give you a partial negative and a partial positive charge. So the net dipole shown here in graphic D is from bottom to top where you have a positive, a partial positive charge near the hydrogens, a partial negative charge near oxygen. Another way of showing this is sort of in the space filling model here where you have the red is showing a region of negative, of negative charge and the blue is showing regions of positive charge. And because water has this unequal distribution of charge, it can interact with ionic compounds and that's something we'll see in the next slide. But Basically, the negative end of water can interact with and dissolve the positive ions, and then the positive end of water near the hydrogens can interact with the negative ions in an ionic compound, and that's what leads to them dissolving in water. So we have these negative and positive poles in water, which again, because it's a covalent compound, we don't have full negative and full positive charges, but we have unequal distribution of the electron density where we have more negative charge on one side, more positive charge on the other side, and that's able, then those charges are able to in interact with the ions and ionic compounds and lead to dissolving. So now what we're going to do um, is bring up a couple of videos here that show us a few things about solutions, specifically aqueous solutions. So the first one we're going to look at shows us at a microscopic level what is happening uh, when we dissolve a compound in water. So we're going to look at both covalent and ionic compounds and see the differences there. So that's this first video here. Um, the link is in the notes if you want to look at it yourself. So what we're going to do in this video is dissolve two substances, sodium chloride and CH3OH, which is called methanol. We're going to dissolve those in water and look at a microscopic picture of what's happening when those compounds are dissolved. So we all know that if we add salt and NaCl to water and stir it up, it's going to dissolve. We're going to not see the salt anymore. But if we zoom in at the molecular level, let's look at what's happening here. So something we'll talk about later on in the course is that Ionic compounds like sodium chloride, they consist of ordered arrays of positive and negative ions. And so we, t we take this ionic solid, we put it in water, and the water molecules are going to surround the charges, the individual ions, and pull them away in the solution. So when we dissolve an ionic compound, we break the ionic bonds and we completely separate the ions into solution. If you look closely at what's happening here, the negative ions get surrounded by the, the hydrogen atoms in water, which are positively, partially positive charge. And the positive ions, which are shown in red, get surrounded by the oxygen atoms in water where the negative charge resides. So that's what happens when we dissolve an ionic compound. We actually break it up into its individual ions, which for NaCl would be sodium plus and Cl minus. Now let's see what happens when we put a covalent compound in water. So CH3OH is a liquid. It's a covalent compound. We put it in water. It, it will dissolve. But in this case, if we look at what happens when at the molecular level, we still have water molecules surrounding these methanol molecules. Now if you look at the methanol molecule, it has an oxygen, it has a hydrogen, it has an OH bond, so we're going to have this polarity, partial minus, partial positive, and the water molecules are then going to interact with those um, you know, via electrostatic interaction. So we have these methanol molecules which cluster together when they're in the liquid phase, but then when we put them into water, water molecules are going to come in and break up this network. And so what we have is water molecules surrounding each of these methanols and pulling it into solution, completely surrounding it and pulling it away from the rest. But we don't have any bond breaking in this case. When you dissolve a covalent compound, you're not going to break the bonds. You're not going to separate it up like you do for an ionic compound. You're just going to surround it with water molecules. And that's these types of interactions are things we're going to talk about more later in the course, and you'll talk about a lot in detail in chemistry too as well. But keep in mind that the key difference here is that we don't have ions in solution when it's covalent compound. We're just so, uh, solubilizing the molecules and bringing it into solution. So that video sort of showed us at a microscopic level what's going on when we dissolve two different substances in water. So to sort of review the key points that we saw there, when you dissolve ionic compound, the ions separate into solution. So we completely break it up 
into the constituent positive and negative ions. Tell is lagging here. So let's give it a second to catch up. So when we dissolve an ionic compound, the ions separate completely in solution. For covalent compounds, the key point that we saw is that there's no bond breakage. So we can certainly still dissolve covalent compounds, but we're not breaking the bonds, we're not changing the structure in any way, we're just surrounding the molecules with water. Alright, so at the microscopic level, that's what's going on. Now let's look at how do these differences at the microscopic level translate to differences in a macroscopic property. So in this video here, we're going to have a very enthusiastic demonstrator show us different properties of, of solutions, and, typically, and particularly we're going to look at their I, uh, electrical conductivity. So this guy is thrilled to show you what's going on here. So we have a bunch of different substances that we're going to dissolve in water, um, and then we're going to test whether those solutions conduct electricity by seeing if it lights a light bulb. So tap water, we know it has a little bit of things in it, so we get a, a very dim uh, lighting of the light bulb with tap water. Now if we go to distilled water, which is pure water, we see that there is no conductivity. So with distilled water, uh, it doesn't by itself conduct electricity, but when we dissolve NaCl, we see a very strong conductivity, very bright light bulb. HCl, which is a covalent compound, also gives rise to conductivity. NaOH, another ionic compound, also conducts electricity very well. But if we start moving to some other things, so sugar is a covalent compound. When we put the electrode in, we don't see any electrical conductivity. Vinegar is a covalent compound, and we see sort of a weak, uh, you know, dim light bulb, not, not as bright as before. And then ethanol, which is very similar to methanol, another covalent compound, we don't see any electrical conductivity. So we see that there are differences in this property that are, uh, that are determined by the, the properties of the compound that's dissolved. So here we have another ionic compound, but we notice that this compound doesn't dissolve. Uh, it stays separated in the water and we don't see any electrical conductivity. So the key point here is that for ionic compounds, they have to dissolve in water to give rise to conductivity, but an ionic compound by itself will not conduct electricity if it's not dissolved in water. Okay, so that's uh, what we saw in that video. So we have these key properties of, of solutions. So just comparing ionic compounds and covalent compounds, ionic compounds, when they're dissolved in solution, they conduct electricity. And hopefully that makes intuitive sense because we saw that ionic compounds have individual positive and negative ions. So these ions can conduct electrical current. So ionic compounds in solution conduct electricity. And a solution that conducts electricity, and there are some covalent compounds that do this as well as we'll see, but any solution that conducts electricity is called an electrolyte solution. So that's another key definition for us, which we're going to see some more details on here in a second. So if it conducts electricity, we call it an electrolyte. All right, so let's then um, talk about, in more detail, electrolyte solutions and, and break them down a little bit further. So for electrolytes, we have both strong and weak electrolytes. And we also have non-electrolytes, which are, are solutions that don't conduct electricity. So strong electrolytes are going to be composed of soluble ionic compounds. In class on Wednesday, we'll, we'll learn about which compounds are and are not soluble. But soluble ionic compounds, when they're dissolved in water, give rise to strong electrolytes. And then there's another category of compounds that will, that will give rise to strong electrolytes, which are called strong acids. So strong acids are covalent compounds, but when they dissolve in water, they completely separate into H plus and the, and the anions. We, we learned about the nomenclature of acids before, so we're at least familiar with some of them. The strong acids that you want to be familiar with are HCl, HBr, and HI, so the three heavier halogen acids. And then there's some of these oxo acids as well, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and perchloric acid, HClO4. So these are the six strong acids that you should be familiar with, and when these dissolve in water, they completely separate into H plus ions and then whatever the anion is. So as an example, HCl, which was the one they showed in the video, 
it dissolves in water to give H plus and Cl minus. And we'll talk in more detail about that on Wednesday as well. And these strong electrolyte solutions then will conduct electricity really well. Now there's another class of electrolytes that we call weak electrolytes. And in this case, the compounds partially break down into ions, but not completely, so there's still a lot of intact covalent molecules. So they, they partially break down into ions, and they weakly conduct electricity. So the main category of compounds we want to be familiar with for, for weak electrolytes are going to be weak acids. You'll learn a lot more about weak acids in chemistry too, but for our purposes, weak acids are all other acids besides the six that I've listed above as strong acids. So things like phosphoric acid, H3PO4, um, and acetic acid, H2C3O2, um, those are what we call weak acids, and they partially break down into ions, so you're going to get some ions in solution that conduct electricity but most, and most of the molecules remain intact, and that's another thing we'll talk about more on Wednesday. And then finally, non-electrolytes have no electrical conductivity, so we can dissolve things in water and, and see that there's no conductivity. We saw a few examples of that in the video as well. Um, and as we saw in the video, the ones that were non-electrolyte solutions, the ones that didn't conduct electricity, were the covalent compounds that are not acids. I guess one thing I should mention, um, for weak electrolytes, we also can have weak bases that give rise to this behavior. The only weak base we need to be familiar with in this course is ammonia NH3. But if it's a covalent compound that's not an acid or a base, something like ethanol or sugar, which doesn't break down into any ions, then when we dissolve that in water, the solution is not going to conduct electricity at all. All right, so then moving on now, now that we sort of understand what happens when we dissolve compounds in water, Let's look at one type of problem we can give you. So we have this example here. How many moles of ions are present when 3.00 grams of silver 1 nitrate is dissolved in water? So whenever we dissolve an ionic compound in water, we can ask you, you know, how many moles of, of one ion or you know, another ion is there, how many total moles of ions as we do here. And we, we have to keep in mind that when we dissolve an ionic compound in water, it separates completely into its ions. So if we have silver nitrate, AgNO3, as a solid and we put it into water, it's going to completely separate into Ag plus ions and NO3 minus. And then one thing we'll start seeing now is that when an ion or any compound is completely dissolved in solution, we put a little Aq next to it, which tells us that it's an aqueous ion, it's completely dissolved in water. So if we look at what's happening here, when we dissolve silver plus and NO3 minus in water, we get two moles of ions. So for every one mole of AgNO3 that we dissolve, we get one mole of Ag+, plus, one mole of NO3-, minus, and a total of two moles of ions. And that's going to be the key relationship involved in solving this problem. So if we're looking for the total number of moles of ions, we have three grams of silver nitrate. And then the first thing we can do is convert that into moles. We have a mass. We can use the molar mass to convert into moles. So one mole of AgNO3, as we're given in the problem, has a mass of 169.87. And then the key conversion here that many of you will forget when doing these problems, I guarantee it, is that if we're looking for the total number of moles of ions, this is the moles of AgNO3. Well, as, I, as I said above, we have two moles of ions per every mole of AgNO3 that dissolves. So you have to multiply by two to account for the fact that there's two equivalents of ions being formed. So that converts moles of AgNO3 into moles of ions, and we get 0.0353 moles. All right, so that's going to be the, the way we do these problems. When we dissolve ionic compounds in water, keep in mind that the ions completely separate, and so you're going to have uh, you know, often multiple equivalents of ions that are released in the solution. 
All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is molarity. So we've kind of defined what a solution is and what's happening when things dissolve. And then molarity is a new unit that allows us to define how much stuff is dissolved in the solution. So it's, it's what we call a concentration unit. It's going to tell us how many or you know how much of a solute is dissolved in the particular solution. So it's a concentration unit, and the unit is really a compound unit. So molarity is a ratio, and it has a very precise definition. So it's going to be moles of solute divided by liters of solution. Now there are other concentration units we can use, so we'll see one later on, which is we can use mass percent, which is the you know the mass of solute over the, the mass of solution. There's some other concentration units that you'll be introduced to in chemistry too, but the one that's most important for this course is molarity, which is moles per liter. But the key point here also, which is especially important if you're preparing a solution in the lab, is that it's liters of solution, not liters of solvent. So if we want to make a solution of a certain molarity, we have to make sure that we have the correct volume of the final solution, not just the volume of solvent. All right, so the abbreviation for molarity is just a simple capital M. And so as an example, if we have a solution where we have 2.0 moles of solute divided or dissolved in one liter of solution, we can report this as a 2.0 molar solution, with capital M meaning moles per liter. And because this is a compound unit, moles per liter, we now have a new conversion factor involving moles. So if we know the volume of a solution in liters, if we know the molarity of the solution in moles per liter, we can convert between volume and moles. And that's what we're going to see in some of the upcoming problems. So the first thing we're going to learn how to do is just calculate molarity. All right, so this picture here on the right shows what happens when sulfuric acid is added to sugar. It, it turns black and, and fumes and all kinds of horrible things. So uh, sulfuric acid is a very nasty substance. We don't want to get it on our clothes or anything. But let's uh, look at just a simple calculation involving molarity. So let's say we take 15.0 grams of H2SO4, which has a molar mass of 98.1 grams per mole, and we dissolve that 15 grams in enough water to form 200 milliliters of solution. We want to know what the molarity is. So if we're asked to calculate molarity, because it's a compound unit, we need two things. We need the moles of solute, and we need the liters of solution. So units are important here. We need our solution volume to be in liters whenever we're calculating molarity. All right, so we have to calculate both the numerator and the denominator. So for the, the moles of H2SO4, which is our solute, we again, we're given a mass of H2SO4, 15 grams. We can use the molar mass to figure out how many moles that is. So we have 15 grams of H2SO4. And then one mole of H2SO4 has a mass of 98.1 grams. So that molar mass is 98.1. We divide by the molar mass. Very routine calculation for us now. And we get 0 0.153 moles of H2SO4. All right, so that's going to be our numerator here, 0 0.153 moles. Now we need the liters of, whoops, I messed up here. This is liters of solution, not solute. Bad mistake. All right, so liters of solution. Sorry about that. The liters of solution, we're given a volume in milliliters. We're, we're telling you that we're making 200 milliliters of solution, so we need to convert milliliters into liters. So make sure you use the correct units in the denominator. So 200 milliliters, and the conversion again, one liter is 1,000 milliliters. So milli means 1,000 times smaller, so if we divide by 1,000, that'll give us the volume in liters, which is 0 .200. So that's going to be the number we put here in the denominator, 0 .200 liters. And that then works out to 0 0.765 molar solution. All right, so we divide moles of solute by liters of solution, and that's going to then give us the final molarity. All right, so then the next problem here, we'll do a couple more examples um, on, on molarity, or I guess one more example on molarity, which is just using molarity as a conversion factor. So as I mentioned, if we have molarity as a compound unit, moles per liter, 
it then forms a ratio for us that we can use to convert between moles of solute and liters of solution. So we have here a solution of hemoglobin. Um, so let's say you go into the bio lab and make a solution of hemoglobin, and we want to know how many heme molecules are, are there in 25 milliliters of a 0 0.00150 molar heme solution. So we're going to, again, just set up a series of conversion factors. So it's always good to look at what is the question asking for. It's looking for the number of heme molecules. So always zoom in on what the question wants you to find, and then we can figure out how to get there using the given information. So the number of heme molecules, we're given 25 milliliters of solution that has a molarity of 0 0.00150 molar. So we can use that information to, to get into moles of hemoglobin. So we have 25.0 milliliters of solution. Now remember that molarity is moles per liter. So if we have a volume of solution and we want to use the molarity, we have to first convert into liters. So one liter per 1,000 milliliters, same conversion we did in the last problem. So now we have liters of solution and we can use the molarity to find out how many moles of heme there are. So there's 0, 0.00 one five zero moles of heme for every one liter of solution. All right, so again, we have this capital M here means moles per liter, moles of solute per liter of solution. Now the question that was asking for the total number of heme molecules, so here we have moles of heme, and again, if we want to go from moles into number of molecules, we have to use Avogadro's number. So there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd heme molecules for every one mole of heme. All right, so keep in mind that distinction. If you want individual number of molecules or an individual number of atoms, whatever the case is, we have to use Avogadro's number. So that's the last step there, and we get 2.26 times 10 to the 19th molecules. All right, so most of these conversions we've seen before, we just have this one new step here using the molarity to convert between liters of solution and moles of solute. And that's going to be a very important conversion for us all throughout this chapter, especially when we come back and start doing stoichiometry at the end of this chapter. All right, the last thing I want to talk about in regards to molarity is the concept of dilution. So what we're doing with dilution is we're going to take a pure solvent and add it to a solution to change the concentration. So we add pure solvent to a solution. Or vice versa, so we can add the solution to pure solvent, whatever the case is. And we're going to make a solution that has a lower concentration. So basically we're just, uh, the word dilution means we're making the concentration lower, and we do that by adding pure solvent, or adding the solution to pure solvent. So let's look at a picture of what this looks like. Let's say we have a small volume of a solution here, and let's represent dissolved solute mo molecules or particles as red dots here. So let's say in this solution we have 10 solute molecules. 10 molecules, were, or 10 whatever, dissolved in this water. So this starting solution here has um, 10 solute molecules, and we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to add this to another beaker that has pure solvent in it. So we're going to add it to a larger volume of pure solvent. We're going to take this whole solution and dump it in here, and then what we're still going to have is the same 10 solute, solute molecules dissolved. So when we do a dilution, we're not changing the number of dissolved molecules or particles. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6... 7, 8, 9, 10. So we still have 10 dissolved solute molecules, but now they occupy a larger volume of solution. So if we write then sort of some qualitative relationships here, our starting solution has a higher concentration, a larger molarity, because it has, a, and then it has a smaller volume. And once we do the dilution, we've prepared a solution down here that has a smaller molarity. So the solute particles are more spread out into a larger volume. All right, so whenever we do dilution, there's sort of this inverse relationship. We're starting with 
a higher molarity and a smaller volume, and we're preparing a new solution that has a smaller molarity and a larger volume. And a key point here is that the molds of solute, whatever our solute molecules or, or ions are, that stays the same before and after dilution. So we're not changing the amount of solute that's in the solution, we're just changing the volume, which then, of course, changes the molarity as well. All right, and with the idea now that the number of solute particles doesn't change, the moles of solute doesn't change, we can now derive the dilution equation. So we know that molarity is defined as moles of solute, let me just use the proper abbreviation, mole, sorry, mole of solute divided by volume of solution, if we want to put it in more general terms. So then if we rearrange this equation, the molarity times the volume is equal to the moles of solute. We know that the moles of solute stays the same before and after dilution. So the initial number of moles of solute is equal to the final number of moles of solute. And so what this means then is we can write an equation where the product of molarity and volume, which is the moles of solute initially, is equal to the product of molarity and volume after the dilution. So M1V1 equals M2V2. And anytime we're talking to, about dilution, this is the equation we want to think about. So the product of molarity and volume before the dilution equals the product of molarity and volume after the dilution. All right, so let's look at a couple of examples of dilution problems to close out this lecture here. So the first thing we have to do is recognize when we're asking you about dilution. So this problem here, what volume of 6 molar NaOH is needed to prepare 250 milliliters of 0.5 molar NaOH solution? So the key words that tell us that this is dilution. First of all, we're not doing any chemistry. We're not reacting the NaOH with anything. It's still the same substance before and after. And as we see, we're just changing the concentration. So dilution means really all we're doing is changing the concentration, and that's the only time we want to use that dilution equation. So what we're looking for here is a volume, which we can call V1, the initial volume. We're given our initial molarity, M1. Now it's fairly arbitrary what you define as M1 and V1, and M2 and V2, just make sure that the correct ones are paired together. So this M1 needs to be paired with V1, and then we have our final volume, V2, is 250 milliliters, and our final molarity, M2, is 0.5 molar. So we think immediately of the dilution equation, M1, V1 equals M2, V2. And we're solving for V1, which is our unknown. So V1 is going to be M2, V2 over M1. Now what we'll see here in these types of problems is that it doesn't really matter what units we use. The concentration is always going to be in molarity. But if we're solving for V1, our, our initial, our, our V2 is 0.500 molar. V2 is given to us in milliliters, 250 milliliters. Now you might think, oh, we have to convert to liters here, but really you don't because this is a ratio. So the M1 goes in the denominator, 6.00 molar. Molarity cancels out, and this is going to give us our final answer in milliliters. So you have to keep track of what your units are to make sure whatever's in the numerator and the denominator cancel out, but it doesn't really matter what units of volume you use. So here if you use milliliters, that's going to give us an answer in milliliters, which is 20.8. All right, so the math here is pretty simple. It's just what's a simple equation, rearrange, and solve for the unknown. Now, this last problem here is a little bit more involved. It's still a dilution problem. So we're, we're starting with concentrated phosphoric acid, which is 90% by mass, and it has a density of 1.50 grams per milliliter. And we want to know how many milliliters of this solution are needed to prepare 2 liters of a 0.1 molar solution. So again, we're looking for an unknown volume, which we can call... V1. We're given our final volume and our final molarity. This is going to be V2. This is going to be M2. But we don't know what our M1 is. So we, we can think of the dilution equation. M1 V1 equals M2 V2. We're again solving for an unknown volume, which really the same setup as last problem, M2 V2 over M1. But here we're not directly given M1. What we're given instead is a concentration that's a mass percent, 90% by mass. So here's an example of a, of a our, where we have to be able to convert between one concentration in a mass percent and another molarity. Because M1 has to be molarity for this to work. 
So if we're going to look for M1, which is moles per liter, we're starting with a 90 mass percent solution. So the solution of concentrated phosphoric acid has 90 grams of solute, H3PO4, for every 100 grams of solution. Uh, that's what 90% by mass means. And now what we need to do is convert this into molarity. So we need our numerator to be moles, and we need our denominator to be liters. So converting the numerator grams into moles is very straightforward. We use the molar mass. So one mole of H3PO4 has a mass of 97.99 grams. So we're given the molar mass of H3PO4 in this problem, which is right here. And so we can use that molar mass to convert the denominator of this mass percent ratio into moles. And now we need to convert, sorry, the numerator into moles. And now we need to convert the denominator, 100 grams of solution, into liters of solution. So that's where the density is going to come into play. Density is grams per milliliter. So if we use, we want grams to cancel out and that will give us in, get us into milliliters of solution. So the density is 1.50 grams per one milliliter. So grams cancels out, we're in now milliliters of solution for the denominator. But we need to go to liters, so we have one more step. There are 1,000 milliliters of solution per one liter of solution. So that cancels out milliliters, and now we have moles per liter. Okay, so we need to press that out. So we have moles per liter now. And so what that works out to then is 13.8 molar. Alright, so that series of steps was needed to find our M1, 13.8 molar. And now that we have our starting molarity, we can then plug everything into the dilution equation. So V1 is going to be M2 V2 over M1, which is going to be 0 0.100 molar. That's our final concentration after dilution. V2 is the final volume, which is 2.00 liters. And then M1 we just found is 13.8 molar. Now, again, keeping close track of our units, molarity cancels out. Our volume now is going to be liters, 0 0.0145 liters. But again, read the problem closely all the time. So we're looking for how many milliliters of this solution. So we have to convert this volume into milliliters. So we have 0 0.0145 liters. And then we use that conversion 1,000 milliliters per one liter to convert into the correct units, which is going to be 14.5 milliliters. All right, so that takes us to the end. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties with the original video. Um, please, if you have any more questions about this lecture, let me know, and I will see you in class later today.